My name's uh, Jonathan Gass. I'm an application scientist here at Nanom, and uh, with me is Daniel McGruffitt, a, a fellow application scientist, and Sheila Zipfel, a wonderful product manager. And we have the pleasure today of working with uh, Alex Sherwood as he shows some psilocybin uh, polymorphs. So take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm Alex Sherwood. I'm a medicinal chemist at the USONA Institute. I've, I've worked with USONA for about four years now, and I have uh, contributed to the some of the process development work that we've done to produce uh, GMP psilocybin that is actually being used in uh, several of the clinical trials that are that are being run right now with with psilocybin. So what we're looking at here in uh, these three images are they're all psilocybin. So so each of these images contains a picture of of pure synthetic psilocybin. But what's different in these three images, which is not actually readily apparent, is that they are comprised of three different crystal forms. Uh, mm. And so on the left here, this mm. is a, what's called the hydrate of psilocybin, hydrate A. And then we've got two anhydrous polymorphs, polymorph A and, and polymorph B. And so we are talking about uh, a recent manuscript that, uh, that we just published that actually went into detail and, and looked at the, the crystal structure solutions specifically for polymorph A and polymorph B. Uh, what we were interested in, in being able to accomplish was to be able to, to look at any sample of solid psilocybin and be able to, to mathematically calculate the amounts of each of these three crystalline forms that were present in that sample. And in order to do that, the actual crystal structure solutions for the three different forms of psilocybin were required. And so about a year ago, we were actually successful in solving the crystal structure for hydrate A here. And the reason why hydrate A was, was, was relatively oh, easily actually, solved. Alex, uh, could we take a look at that structure maybe? Uh, I think you have sure. one of those uh, loaded in. Yeah, and, sure, uh, sure. Just looking here, it looks like they're all crystalline. Volumes. Yeah, that's right. So, so they're all crystalline, and so we had uh, powder diffraction data on all three forms, and we were able to solve the structure for the trihydrate relatively easily by single crystal. Uh, and as you can see, looking at the crystals here, the, the trihydrate forms these beautiful long needle crystals, which makes them readily amenable to solving by single crystal x-ray diffraction. So in order to, to mm. do a single crystal structure solution, you need to be able to actually isolate a single crystal and mount it onto the diffractometer. And so mm. uh, our group was, was able to do that relatively easily for the trihydrated form. Cool. So. When you're manufacturing psilocybin, the, the last step of the synthesis is typically a recrystallization from water, so an aqueous crystallization, which forms this hydrate A. However, it's, it's standard practice when you do a recrystallization is to take your wet cake, so your, your wet crystals, and dry them in a vacuum oven. And so what we found with drying the, the hydrate A, so at you know, 30 to 50 degrees on, in vacuum for about a day, uh, that we'd get a new powder pattern, uh, and we called this polymorph A. And so polymorph A is the, the crystal that results from the, the collapse of the trihydrated form. And so here, is the crystal structure that arises from the drying of the trihydrated form. So in the trihydrated form, for every one 
molecule of psilocybin, let's see, there are three you coordinating could... water molecules here. And so in that drying process, those relatively volatile water molecules leave and this crystal structure collapses. And so now these psilocybin molecules reorient themselves around all of these rotatable bonds to give this anhydrous polymorph here. And so we can mm. see the, the asymmetric unit of polymorph A is here. You know, and so what was really, I think, enlightening for me, jumping into Nanome for the first time this morning and, and looking at these crystal structures in VR for the first time was really recalling, you know, being in physical chemistry classes a decade ago and recalling, you know, all of those, those symmetry operations and point groups and mm -hmm. actually being able to, to see that for the first time it was always this abstract concept of you know well, what what is a crystal right so it's this repeating arrangement of of molecules so you get this long range order by the same thing repeating but what does that really right. mean and so for the first time at this morning actually being able to to look at this and see okay here is the the asymmetric unit of polymorph a and being able to to take this asymmetric unit and just line it up with oh, yeah. the unit cell here and see that this is what actually <laughs> makes this crystal and to see that this is different from the hydrated form so by looking at the the orientations of oh. those rotatable bonds mm. this is what makes two different crystal forms and you know knowing that conceptually is is one thing but, but being here right now and seeing that and being able to just hold it and manipulate it is really, really something special. And then, I mean, to take it a step further, I mean, we're looking at the picture here of this, this trihydrate, so these needle crystals, which I've, I've filtered and handled a, a million times. But I'm sorry. To, to take it all the way down to the, the molecular level and, and see that, that this is what makes that is is really really something mm. phenomenal like on the inside of this where mm. where these interactions are showing these hydrogen bonds are showing is really obvious that that stack of the molecule mm. is just not present over here this is a whole different network of interactions right it's, yeah so yeah. that that sort of um six-membered ring that forms yeah, from the, the two the two phosphates uh, that was right. it really stuck out to me as an obvious feature that I, I didn't really pick up on when I was looking at the paper. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really the the key difference in polymorph A and the trihydrate. So in the trihydrate, it's clear that the water molecules, so the three water molecules per molecule of psilocybin, are really kind of the glue in this hydrogen bonding network that's holding this whole thing together. But when you drive off those water molecules on drying, the new, I think, just dominant interaction is this, this what looks to me as a chemist and not a crystallographer, this ultra-stable six-membered hydrogen bond, uh, you know, sort of mm. pseudo-bonded motif here. I mean, going back to organic chemistry, you can actually see the, the sort of chair conformation here yeah. in the the phosphate and so that right. to me really seems like the the driving uh intra molecular force uh intermolecular force i'm sorry that is, is really holding the, this thing together well seeing how then the yeah your mean there how that also then stacks on top of that like how it just builds off of that that mm -hmm. kind of ring you're describing that's just that's really, really impressive to be able to just kind of see how it just springs out from that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the heterocyclic nitrogen in the indole ring that's forming another hydrogen bond with, with the phosphate. And then once again, you can see the, the kind of long range structure here. So over here, you've got that same structure inverted and the same type of, of hydrogen bond here. 
Mm. And so then looking at polymorph B, which is here in mm -hmm. yellow. And so as you can see in, in polymorph B, that same sort of six-membered ring motif is, is preserved. Mm. But there's, there's one more unique feature in polymorph B that's not seen in polymorph A, and that is in the asymmetric unit here. So I've pulled out one asymmetric unit from polymorph B. First, in polymorph B, the asymmetric unit is comprised of two molecules of psilocybin. So these are, are distinct from one another. So they're in two different conformations. Um, but also that one of the asymmetric unit molecules of psilocybin has an intramolecular mm -hmm. hydrogen bond that's holding it mm -hmm. in this, this conformation here. Yeah, and wow. so the reason that we're actually even looking at these crystal structures right now is uh. due to the work of, of Jim Caddick. So he was the, the senior author on this paper. Uh, so as I had mentioned earlier about the trihydrate, so these were readily solvable by, by single crystal X-ray diffraction. But one of the consequences of the drying that's done with the, the hydrated form is you lose those water molecules, and when that crystal structure collapses, the uh, the actual solid form turns into a powder. And mm. so it, I mean, you, I've done this before. You can actually watch it in real time. You put these big crystals in a vacuum oven, and as oh, soon yeah. as you start lowering the pressure and raising the heat, they just turn into a powder without even touching them. <laughs> it's really it's amazing to watch. Oh, but unfortunately, cool. it makes it virtually impossible to solve the crystal structure by a single crystal experiment. And uh, so with uh, the help of, of Jim Caddick, uh, he's the crystallographer, we, we were able to solve the, these two crystal structures using only the powder diffraction data, which is, again, I'm not a crystallographer, but it, from my understanding is, is not a, a, a trivial task. Trivial. <laughs> and, sure. uh, and so Jim was able to solve not one, but two crystal structures, the two that we were particularly interested in, the polymorph A and polymorph B here, uh, mm. and then actually confirmed the results using uh, dens density functional theory calculations to essentially check the structures to determine if they were correct or not. And so we, we have very, very high confidence in the, um, the fit of these two crystal structures. Mm. But ultimately, what that allowed us to do in the, the manuscript, once we had the, the solved crystal structures in hand for the hydrate polymorph A and polymorph B, was to use a technique called Rietveld analysis. So once you have a crystal structure, you can calculate that powder pattern backwards. So you can essentially predict what mm. the powder pattern would look like for mm. any one of, of uh. these, these crystal forms. And what that allows you to do then is if you have any powder pattern that was a, say, a mixture of hydrate A, mm. polymorph B, and polymorph A, with those calculated patterns, you can fit them to the mixtures and then determine exactly how much of hydrate A, polymorph A, and polymorph mm. B are in those powder patterns. Mm -hmm. And that was really the, the driving force was you know, we went back and looked at some 23 different samples of psilocybin. And it allowed us mm. to say with, with mathematical precision that yeah. hydrate A, polymorph A, and polymorph B occurred again and again and again throughout all of yeah. psilocybin synthesis history. Well, is real that fast, something Alex. you can then? Oh, sorry. Is that something you can st then like track and p put through another process of drying and mm. see if you if you can converge on a single polymorph in your sample? Yeah, absolutely. So in the pharmaceutical development of psilocybin, uh, polymorph A is the preferred form. And so by mm. being able to look at how much polymorph B do we have, how much polymorph A, we could design that crystallization and drying process such that it only mm. targets polymorph A. Mm. Uh, that's sort of the, the tricky piece with using x-ray powder diffraction is when you have a powder pattern, Sure, it's, it's a fingerprint, but it doesn't necessarily tell you 
whether or not you have a, a single crystalline form there. And, and so that was really where the, the solved crystal structures came in and, and allowed us to really determine whether or not a powder pattern was a single polymorph or consisted of, of multiple crystal forms present. I guess it yeah. would also be some sort of indication if you if you did come across a new polymorph you hadn't seen, if the math couldn't fit the the diffraction oh, yeah. pattern yeah. In, into yeah absolutely. So there are probably about a dozen known polymorphs for psilocybin. Most of mm. them are actually uh, solvates. So in, in the same way that the hydrated form is you know coordinates with uh, water molecules. Uh, most of the polymorphs for psilocybin are, are solvates. So we don't really like to consider those for pharmaceutical development. So for example, the, the monomethanol solvate of psilocybin is, is a known crystal form. But if you're using this in a pharmaceutical application, well, we don't really want you know, one mole of methanol for every, every mole of, of, of psilocybin <laughs> that, that's in the drug. And so that's why I mentioned earlier that these are the three most pharmaceutically relevant uh, forms of psilocybin because they represent oh, right. either hydrated or anhydrous forms. So we're not really worried about uh, other solvent molecules there. But in terms of, of anhydrous forms, there's not much evidence to suggest that there's anything other than, than A and B, but you're absolutely right. So with the solved structures, if we do have a sample of anhydrous psilocybin that has a, a unique powder pattern, we can say definitively that that it's neither A nor B, should that, that yeah, or happen. Nor a mixture, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just that was the question, whether, mm -hmm. you know, this, the internal, uh, actually, now I'm going to try to find one for real in the structure, mm -hmm. because I think I didn't have a real one. This is an intermolecular mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. But um, Over here. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. If that leads to, you know, sol solubility differences and melting point differences that are dramatic relative to the relative mm -hmm. to it's a good question. A. It's a, it's actually hard to know. So polymorph B is surprisingly challenging to form. So uh, in in the, the second page of the manuscript, we show the conditions that were used to generate pure polymorph B, and you actually have to take polymorph A and heat it at about 170 degrees for about an hour wow. to get it to interconvert to polymorph B. So there hasn't been a lot of direct study on polymorph B just because the, the conditions to form it are, are quite harsh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's almost like it, the, the conditions to form it are, are disruptive enough. I wonder what compensates for the loss of that. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. No, it's a good question. So from, from some of Jim's calculations in the, the paper, uh, it, we were able to show that one of the, the molecules in polymorph B is actually in the, the lowest energy form for psilocybin. So you would think that, mm. that polymorph B would predominate. Huh. Uh, but in fact, it, it's, it's quite challenging to, to generate. Um, and it, it's hard to make pure polymorph B where it really shows up is it, it shows up sort of transiently. So if, for example, when you're drying hydrate A, if, if you heat the, the hydrate A too much, what you'll end up seeing is a mixture of, of A and B. Mm. And the mechanism by which polymorph B forms directly from hydrate A is actually not, not understood at this point. We, we know the conditions that are required to make polymorph A uh, exclusively. Uh, and so it requires really gentle drying of hydrate A. But if you heat hydrate A too much during drying, then you'll end up with this mixture of, of A and B, which is, is undesirable. Really, it is always uh, surprising to me as a person who's you know, put a lot of molecules into cells but understanding really, you know, this kind of base level understanding that we need to have before it even, you know, enters solution. 